Well, good evening, everybody home. Maureen and Pam, or not Pam, it says Pam, but it's Alex. I can see that. And hi, everybody here. It's good to be back again. Um, missed you all last week. <laughs> of course, you saw all that shtick the week before. So, um, yeah, last week we re recorded what you saw two weeks ago because <clears throat> we had technical difficulties. So, the previous 24 sessions are now on the internet. And um, this is number 25. There will be 27 before we switch over to Exodus. More about that later. Oh, I don't okay, the 24 is on the other computer in the, in the other family room. Should I stop that and we'll watch it later? I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to push mute on. Oh, well, let me see. I have to do my diligence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Got dozen, the perfect dozen, right? The prophetic dozen. Okay, well, let's let's make the technology work, Mark. So most of you have been here before, so you've seen this. If you want them on, on my mailing list, there's my email address. Let me know, and I'll put you on the mailing list. Um, those um, The slides from tonight will go out tonight before I go home, because if I don't, I'll forget, and it'll be Christmas. Um, and then this recording will be ready soon. Normally it's tomorrow night. Let me stop here for a moment and say that um, the last recording, which was recorded a week ago tonight, was slow to get on the internet. And I apologize for that, but let me explain the reason. Uh, my colleague, Consuelo Pineda, who does all of our electronic wizardry, Tuesday last week, she was involved in a quite nasty car accident. Her car was totaled. It was on the third anniversary of a very serious car accident that she was in in California. Um, luckily, her injuries were what Pastor Jerry calls soft tissue, and she's back at work today with a new car. But things had to slow down last week, and um, she's, she's pedaling hard, as best her body will allow, to catch up this week and with Christmas. So tonight's session will be, up, will be recorded. It will be on the site if you want to watch it again. But it might take a day or two or three more than, than usual. So please bear with us. Um, yep, and you folks at home, if you'll mute, unless you have a question. And if you have a question, shout away. We're, we're anxious to hear it. Um, you may remember we announced the last time we were together that uh, our follow-on class, which will begin um, the first week in February, will be on Exodus or The Exodus with a capital T. So the story at the end will extend beyond the book of Exodus into uh, Joshua as the people finally uh, move into the promised land. Okay. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, as we gather this evening with Christmas so near on the horizon, we ask that your holy word about to be born among us will be shared among us on this night. Enlighten us, Heavenly Father. Show us the ways of the world as we know it, and show us your ways that overcome the ways of the world. Lead us, God. Lead us by the, by the advent of your Son among us, a child at birth and a man on the cross at the end, all of it, bidding us to follow him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, because I can't help myself, a little review. Um, you remember last time Joseph, um, after testing his brothers, finally revealed himself. The great man of Egypt is now known to them as his brother. And it was a very emotional um, gathering as they now recognized one another. And what had transpired over the 22 years since uh, Joseph was thrown into a pit by his loving brothers was that um, they had transformed from all of the sin they had committed from all the transgressions they had committed along the way over that very long period and through especially through perhaps the testing that joseph had put them through they were now faithful and godly men that were true to all of their brothers and especially their father and judah who was perhaps the most unlikely among them you may remember his tryst with tamar that, that resulted in one of jesus ancestors 
and his treatment of, of his sons and his wife before that, and so much more, including the, the murder of the people of Shechem, he has, he's been redeemed in all of this. And he's become the leader of the sons of Jacob. Um, so he's had the, the most significant transformation. And at the end, at the final test, just before Joseph re, uh, reveals himself, it is Judah who stands and says that in place of Benjamin, the one who stand, stood to be punished for the, uh, the theft of uh, Joseph's sacred chalice, that he would take the punishment in place of his younger brother. That substitution of one for the other makes Judah at this stage of his life the most Christ-like of the brothers, it would appear. And it's, it is perhaps for that reason that uh, the Messiah will come through Judah's line, even as, as virtuous as, as uh, Joseph was. So after that emotional reconciliation of the brothers, um, the 11 of them, minus, of course, Joseph, hurry back to Canaan to get dad and tell him what they've discovered. There's some tension there, remember, because 10 of those 11 brothers knew they had sold Joseph into slavery, and they haven't told dad for 22 years, and now he's alive. And they're going to have to explain that maybe, right? <laughs> if not, how, why didn't you tell me he went to Egypt instead of being torn up by an animal? At least, why didn't you tell me? And they all, apart from Benjamin, they all stand in that tension. But they stand before dad, dad, as we heard last time, and they tell him that uh, his son Joseph has instructed him or them to pick up dad and all that they own, all three generations that's back in Canaan, and bring them to Egypt to uh, survive the famine. They are pointed toward the land of Goshen. We'll hear a lot more about Goshen this evening. Jacob at first won't believe it, but then finally the evidence is overwhelming. And once he understands that these things are true, his first reaction, just like Joseph's had been. Joseph, if you remember, when he revealed himself, the first thing he asked is, how's our father? And his father's first reaction, once he realizes the truth is, my son Joseph is alive. It's, it's almost a mirror image of one another. And so at this stage of his life, Jacob, uh, sometimes called Israel, is, is just overwhelmed. And he has only one more desire in life, and it's to see Joseph before he dies. Let us go. Let us go. And now, it, it, as we go forward, where we ended last time could have been the end of the book of Jack. Exodus, or it's at least the end of a complete story. As we enter into what we will hear tonight, it's almost as if it was written by a different author, but it's a continuance of the story. You know, it's like going to a sequel at the movies, something like that. And, and there are some differences between the two, but the story continues almost as if it continues from an ending. So it's like a, a new story has been appended. And maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was sort of an appendix once upon a time, but it's over the, the centuries and, and millennia, it's been knit together into a, a greater story. So consider Jacob now. He's been told that his son, who seems to have risen from the dead, is down in, in Egypt and saying, come, right? And that's, that seems to be a signal from God that this is what, what Jacob should do. I mean, sometimes it's, it, the evidence of life is overwhelming that this is what God intends. And, and Jacob hears that, and he, he knows the tug to go to his long-lost son. And, and it's by God's grace that, that this missing son that he thought was torn apart by animals is now essentially running the greatest nation on earth. At, uh, give me just a second, Jim. At the same time, God has promised for generations the family this land in Canaan, this land where Jacob lives. Does he leave God's promise to go where God is leading him? Or does he stay where God has promised and then not go off on an errand? Which way is God tugging him to go? He feels it both ways. Yes, Jim. 
uh, on, on that point, God had previously said, you know, to Abraham, don't go to Egypt. And for well, that was to Isaac. That was to Isaac. Abraham went to Egypt actually twice. Right, but didn't God tell him not to go, even though he ended up going? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't recall that being the case. I do distinctly recall him uh, forbidding Isaac to go. Yeah. Uh, the other point, uh, do you think that he remembers the dream that Joseph had told him and that he chastised Joseph for having that dream? The or, bowing dream of the... Uh, well, the yeah, bowing down the sun and the moon and the uh, yes. stars. Um, interesting question. Genesis won't address that, right. but I, I don't think Jacob's forgetting much of anything having to do with Joseph. So I, I would have to say yes, but there's no evidence that I'm right. Okay. Okay. Every decision that Jacob has made through the story that we've been presented, where he's had a tough decision to make, or he's had a turning point in his life, God has spoken to him. Right. We had the, the wrestling match at the Jabbok and, and we've had several other instances like that where God has appeared and told Jacob, this is the way it's going to be or this is what I want you to do. In this case, where Jacob has to make this tough decision where we left it last time, God has not said anything to Jacob. He sees only what life is presenting to him at this point. OK. Um, after just just Mark talking here, doesn't God have the power to make the famine go away so that Jacob can stay in Canaan? Yes, of course. Yes. You think Jacob thought of that? Yes. At the same time, here's Joseph's voice coming out of Egypt. It's it's a tough call as we left it where we left it two weeks ago. Okay. Any questions or thoughts about where we were two weeks ago before we forge ahead? Okay, tonight, chapters 46 and 47. And we'll, eh, we'll take it bit by bit, stage by stage. In uh, verse 1, so Israel began his journey, taking with him all that he had. When he came to Be'er Sheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. God spoke to Israel in a vision during the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. He replied, here I am the prophetic answer, right? Here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I myself will certainly bring you back from there. Joseph will close your eyes. Anything strike you about that? Yeah, that's what the closing of the eyes yeah. is all about. But he will die in the comfort of the arms of his favored yeah. son, Joseph. But he, God will make a great nation of him in Egypt. How does that work? We're going to see. Um, so despite any misgivings he may have had, Israel, as he's called at this point, begins his journey. He begins faithfully to go south, and he ends up in Be'er Sheba, right? Now, that's a change. That's a change for Jacob, fundamentally in his life. Everything's been pointed now, now to this point at realizing the promises of his father and his grandfather, and now he's going to Egypt, where the great nation was supposed to be in the land of promise. Now the great nation is going to grow and of all places, Egypt, Misraim in Hebrew. Has God ever given you a change of course in your life? Has God ever taken you to a place where you didn't necessarily expect to be going? It, it happens to all of us in a lot of different contexts. Right? We can have a tragedy in our life that refocuses us. We can have a, a joyous event in our lives, a marriage. They can take us to a new direction. You know, we can be well into life and well ensconced in what we were doing. And this isn't about me, but Tony remembers me from 25 and more years ago. 
And all of a sudden, off I go to ministry. That people who knew me before that would would have been shocked yes. or or just laugh. <laughs> Shocked, not laugh. <laughs> well, you were laughing. <laughs> Anyhow, so when we come to those crossroads in life and God is, is perceived as leading us to go somewhere else or to do something else, the proper recourse is to find ourselves in prayer. And that's exactly what Jacob does. He's in Be'er Shaba, a place we've heard a number of times in, in uh, Genesis thus far. It's a place where Abraham built an altar. He may, in fact, be at his grandfather's altar, aren't told, but he's in the same geographic location, and he offers sacrifice. He offers prayer to God. Now, Pierre Sheba is way down in the south of, of the land of Canaan at the time, or what would become Israel. If you're heading out of, out of uh, Canaan, you're, you're pretty much at, at the last place you can go before you're in Egypt, right? And once you're in Egypt, you're, you're perhaps under the influence of the military there, which was, again, the strongest on earth. And there, there wasn't much chance to come back, at least not without the, uh, the agreement of the authorities in Egypt. So I call it the point of no, no return. And he worships, and then he continues into Egypt does Jacob. But at this point, at this point, at Be'er Shaba, God comes to him and what we're told is a vision. Could be a dream, however that manifests itself. It comes in a vision. And God at this point calls him, as Jim has been keeping score, God calls him Jacob. And what, what you have to, this one of the reasons I said that it appears this is an appended story or an added on story from the original, um, maybe only a few years later, but from the original, is that all the way through Genesis to this point, when this man was acting faithfully, he was Israel. And when he was going his own way, he was called Jacob. Well, from chapter 46, this point to the end, through chapter 50, that rule doesn't apply. The names seem to be just used interchangeably. It's, it's almost as if a different hand wrote this part of the story. So we can't attach significance to the Jacob Israel um, ping, pong, ping pong names um, that we've been used to for many weeks now. Yeah, when you started to read that section, that the first line is Israel. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and of it switches to Jacob and Right. And God calls him Jacob when he's acting right. faithfully. So it, the rule that we, we ad, adhere to yeah. disappears at this point. I don't think that's theologically significant, but in terms of judging the man as we see him walk through his life, it is, it, it is different. So God puts the man's mind at rest. He, he had to have that inner turmoil. Shall I go or shall I stay? And the Lord makes promises to Jacob to set his mind at rest, that he will bring him, Israel that is, out of Egypt. God doesn't say when, but we get hints at that when's going to be a long time away, right? Because as was mentioned, he's going to die in Joseph's arms in Egypt. God tells him that. That's comforting in that he gets to be with Joseph, but he will, he, his people, his progeny will be brought out at a much later time after his death. We know that time period to be 400 years. Okay. And this to me was the most shocking thing. God's purpose, as I alluded to earlier, to taking them to Egypt is to make them a great nation. Why could God make them into a great nation in Egypt rather than Canaan? And that's largely what the rest of chapter 46 and 47 is about. To this point, we've got 12 sons. Remember in the, in the um, line of promise, Abraham had one, although he had Ishmael as well. And Isaac had 
um, uh, twins, but one of them fell out of the line of promise. So in the line of promise, we only had one each in those generations. Now we have 12 that stand in, in line. So God is set the foundation in place, but 12, 12 households does not a nation make. Got a long way to go before we're there, right? Um, and the descendants of 12 households, uh, having been raised by fathers who were in their own transformation, they, they've got to learn the ways of the Lord and how to adhere to them. I call that discipline. So a lot of mm, time is going to be needed to form them into a people with identity and with coherence so that they become a nation instead of an extended family. Okay. Now, here's, here's some hints. Here's what we know about Mitzrayim. Sounds like misery, doesn't it? There's a reason for that. Uh, Mitzrayim is the Hebrew word for Egypt, and it has many gods. Canaan had many gods, right? So in that sense, they were the same, although their pantheon of gods were different in the two places. In Egypt, shepherds are despised. You'll hear a verse later where we hear that shepherds are disgusting in the sight of Egypt, okay? That turns out to be to God's advantage. So being that they are disgusting or despised or whatever adjective you want to place on it, that means they're not going to be intermingling with the Egyptians much. They're, the Egyptians' natural inclination is to push them aside. You remember Joseph's brothers at the dinner with the Egyptians in Joseph's house. They had to sit at different tables. And so it shall be as they settle into Egypt. Remember how much trouble Jacob's family got in with the Canaanites here and there, with intermarriage and rapes and all kinds of dysfunction not to mention murder. So the temptation to go out with the locals is going to be squashed by the locals when they get to Egypt. That too helps them form their own nation rather than assimilating with those around them. Up to this point, I haven't said much about technology in Genesis. This is a book that was given to me one, by one of your classmates way back at the beginning, and I've been reading it. And um, you've, you've heard mention of wagons that were sent from Egypt to go get Jacob to bring him back. That's the first mention of any such article in the Bible at all. Um, and so the ideal of, idea of wheeled carts and soon chariots to be mentioned. Those kinds of things were the technological marvels of the ancient world. They existed in Egypt. So by being down in Egypt, it, it, even at an arm's distance, the Israelites, the, the sons of Israel, in the, as the generations unfold, get to learn those technological advantages to take back with them to Canaan. That would make them superior to the um, locals when they returned hundreds of years later. And the richest nation on earth was Egypt. And as long as they're in commerce with them, in close commerce, that too would financially give them um, a great deal of advantage. So there's some interesting things here going on. And they can develop their own distinct culture. Right now, we have no evidence that that's the case. Apart from their understanding that the Lord, their God, is the only God that's the only cultural aspect they have. They have no traditions. They have no teachings. They have no writings that we've learned of. So they have some time to begin to um, build those things and take them in as their own. Yeah, they're probably even a, a gift of masonry, too, where they help build buildings, oh. the pyramids, and so forth. Later, so, later in the time, absolutely. Egypt to help build their own uh, empire. Absolutely. Those things yeah, would come. Yeah. In the 400-year stretch of things, that would come later, but absolutely, that's part of it. No doubt about it. The land of Goshen that uh, had been um, pointed to them, not yet. The deed hasn't been signed, let's say that, but they're heading toward Goshen. Turn It's bottom land. It's green. It's moist. It produces grasses, and they're shepherds. This is good. Their flocks can multiply, and in their culture, flocks equal wealth. So that, that, too, is an advantage 
where they're heading, especially since they're leaving a place that is absolutely torched by the famine. Okay. Verse five and following. Then Jacob started out from Be'er Sheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little children, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent along to transport him. Jacob and all his descendants took their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and they went to Egypt. He brought with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, all his descendants. Anybody read all of chapter 46? Did you read all the names? You're not going to read them tonight. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over that part, but uh, let's discuss um, what leads up to that. In verse 7 that I just read for you, it says that Jacob had daughters, plural. To this point, we've only heard of one, Dina, and we remember the, the struggles that she had um, so long ago. Um, but now this term is applying to a whole family going down. And you must understand that in the counts of people that are about to be confusingly presented before you, um, daughters-in-law are not counted. It is only those, those people who are in the counts of these verses to come are in the Bible's terms from the loins of Jacob. So anybody who married in doesn't count. Their children do, but the ones who married in don't. So the daughters-in-law don't count. And now we know there's at least two daughters. And should they have had husbands, those husbands didn't count either. So it's not a sexist thing. It's just have to be directly born of Jacob to be counted in what follows. Uh, it's, there we go. Now, in the verses I'm not going to read for you, which extend through 25, here are some curiosities. It is one of Simeon's sons, and Simeon, remember, is the most cruel of the 12, or had been earlier in his life. His son, Shaul, was said specifically to be the son of a Canaanite woman, which is interesting only in that that's not said of any of the others. So it leads you to believe the others did not have Canaanite mothers. This one was different. Um, and uh, we'll set Tamar aside, of course, but um that's the case here now where would joseph's other sons have found wives there are other semitic peoples in in the general area of what we now call the middle east and they come from people we've heard of in genesis from ishmael um, ishmaelites if you will from esau the edomites or from keturah who was the second wife of of abraham remember so it is perhaps these women who had daughters themselves who became the wives of Jacob's sons. We're not told, but we are told they're not Canaanites for the most part, right? With the exception, again, of Tamar and, and uh, one other. Um, other notable things about this list. One of the sons of Levi through Kovath gave birth generations later to Moses. Okay, so Moses, as is Aaron and Miriam, his brother and sister, are Levites of what would later be named the, the priestly tribe. That's not the case yet, but that's, that's his, his uh, lineage. One of the grandsons of Judah, and we know Judah to be in the Christ line, Hezron, um, is, is the ancestor of Jesus. And he's in that list as well, as you would expect. Okay. Anybody read that in fine tooth detail? Have any questions about that? <laughs> All right, we'll move on to verse 26 and following that. All the direct descendants of Jacob who went to Egypt with him, with him, were 66 in number. In parentheses in my version, this number does not include the wives of Jacob's sons, which we've already discussed. Counting the two sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt, all the people in the household of Jacob who were in Egypt numbered 70. So we're counting Jake, uh, Joseph, his two sons, and the other one to add to 66 is Jacob himself. So now you have 70 in that accounting, in that accounting, okay? Now let's see if I left anything out. Yeah. 
If you counted all those names, all of them, that were in verses 8 through 25, um, you would have found 70. But we just heard it was 66, right? So there's a bit of a discrepancy there, and we can't account for it. We can speculate. Did some of them not go to Egypt and stay behind? A couple? Did one or two die on the way? How did we get? We don't know. But there's a discrepancy there when you try to, to match the numbers. And again, while the Bible has a lot of math in it, it's not a math book. Okay? Um, again, the wives of sons and grandsons were not counted. They, were, they had married into the clan. The husbands of daughters were not counted. Still, the numbers don't, don't quite line up. 66 were said to come with Jacob into Egypt. And if you take that number and, and add these three that I mentioned before, and Jacob himself, you do get to 70. The problem is 70 were named in those previous verses. So we can't line that up. So one thing we can hang our hat on is the figurative, not the literal number of 70 that come from Jacob's loins. Remember, in Hebrew understanding, numbers don't work like an accountant. You would use them in today's world. The number seven is the, the number of perfection or completion. And a zero is an intensifier. So in the Hebrew tradition, this means just absolutely the right number uh, went down into Egypt. And that's a better way, I think, to take it than trying to reconcile all the numbers like an accountant would. Uh, the number 70 is going to pop up a bunch of times in Israel's history. You'll hear it again and again as you go through their story. Um, the most interesting to me is, is it's extra biblical. Um, at the time that the earliest Christians were beginning to put together what we now call the New Testament, the uh, rabbis understood that they didn't have what we now call the Old Testament. They had a bunch of scrolls, but they didn't have a, a codified grouping of, of texts that were officially the Word of God as they understood it. So they began working on that. And the, under, the legend of history is that the rabbis picked 70 scholars and put them in 70 separate rooms and gave them the scrolls. And they were to come out with a Greek manuscript that would be what we now call the, excuse me, the Old Testament. And according to the legend, each of the, when they opened the doors of the 70 rooms, the 70 scholars had produced exactly the same thing as one another. And so that version of the, that early Greek version of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint, meaning the 70. So from this point until that, 70 was a very, very important number in, in Greek, uh, excuse me, in Hebrew history. Okay, so just a, sorry for the pun, to add up these things. Jacob has 12 sons, so there's 13, right? He has 51 grandsons. He has two great-grandsons that we know of as they enter Egypt. He has two daughters, one of them unnamed, Dina, we've known for a while. He has two great-granddaughters, one of them identified here, Sarah, and one uh, born of Leah, whose name we are not given. And if you add all that up, to 70. But let me go back to that. That's a lot of guys and not many gals. Right? I mean... I come from a family where the first four born were boys, and the fifth one was, my father called her, the other member of the basketball team. <laughs> so, you know, and, and then if you look at the next generation, my sister didn't have any children, and my brother Scott had three sons, my brother Rick had two sons, my bro brother Greg has two sons, I have one son and three daughters. So we have three daughters and a whole bunch of guys in the next generation. So in my family, in two generations, you had a lot of men and then not many women that can happen but here we're not talking about four or five we're talking about 12 and the numbers are rather striking so how do you account for the fact that there are so many males in two generations of this family and so few females so it makes any sense to you at all anybody see any hand of god in that yeah. sure. <laughs> but, but you don't know that there are only two you're assuming because it was plural, there's two 
Could right. Have been more. Well, we're told that I had that other daughter, but we aren't given her name. Right. And then we're given no other examples. But let's let's just think culturally back into Genesis, right? Um, this is a patriarchal period in the era's history. So if a household, if you had a marriage of, let's say, one of the other Semitic tribes came and mar married a person in Joseph's household, if the male was from Joseph's household and the female came from, say, the Ishmaelites or, or one of the others, the Edomites, then which religion, which understanding of the Lord would be practiced in that household? It would be the one that the male would typically, it would be the one that the male would, would carry forward from his fathers. If, however, you had a female born of Jacob marrying an Edomite male, you see the problem. It would be something other than the Lord God of Israel that might, it might well have been followed in that household. So might God, might God have had a hand at this stage of history, having more males in the household in order to prepare this great nation that had been promised. That's pure speculation. But you just look at the numbers and you look at what follows and you think, mm, maybe so, maybe so. Again, unprovable. Okay, a couple more verses. And, and some familiar voices here in, in fami now familiar roles. Jacob sent Judah before him to Joseph to accompany him to Goshen. So they came to the land of Goshen. Joseph harnessed his chariot and went up to meet his father Israel in Goshen. When he met him, he hugged his neck and wept on his neck for quite some time. So the emotion we hear here as Joseph and Jacob are reunited is very similar, but much more brief than it was when Joseph identified himself to his brothers. Um, so the brothers knew they were headed toward Goshen. That was the idea. Um, but Jacob sends the leader of the clan now, Judah, fourth born, not the eldest, fourth born, sends him ahead to make arrangements with Joseph. Now, what arrangements? I mean, Goshen's a pretty big place, as it turns out. It's not a town. It's a big place. Um, many, 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 many hundreds of square miles. So where in Goshen? What part of Goshen? You know, that kind of thing. Joseph's headquarters, if you will, my word, but his place of, of business, his place of, of government work is, is toward Memphis, which is further south and west of Goshen than is Canaan. So as the family's coming down from Canaan, Joseph's here, he gets in his chariot and races to meet them. They're meeting in the middle at Goshen. And he's going, at, he's got a chariot. He can go at some speed. And as I said, it's now clear, Judah is the family leader. He's taking on the responsibility of going and negotiating whatever negotiations are necessary this, let me call it the deed to the land that they're going to have as a family in Egypt. That's been entrusted to Judah. Um, now, having met his father, that's where we see these emotions just spill out. Can you imagine being the father hugging your thought dead son? Again, this is... This is uh, a glimpse of what it must be like when uh, God the Father received his son into heaven after resurrection. That, that sense of emotion and just overwhelming feeling, it gives us a glimpse of that. Okay, okay to finish up chapter 46. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They take care of livestock. They have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. Pharaoh will summon you and say, what is your occupation? Tell him, your servants have taken care of cattle from our youth until now, both we and our fathers. 
so that you may live in the land of Goshen, for everyone who takes care of sheep is disgusting to the Egyptians. So Joseph is, is coaching his brothers. Here's the way it's going to go. Memorize your lines, right? So the emotions were described briefly, but intensely, and we've moved on to the practical matters of, of how to secure the land and, and gain Pharaoh's approval for these things. They don't have a home. They're living in carts and wagons. And, and building a formal home to raise their families is, is of first priority. Goshen has what they need to be shepherds. It's got grass. It's got moisture. It's, uh, it's a good place to go. But remarkably, Egyptians, by and large, don't live there. This is way up in the, if you can picture it in your mind, way up in the northeast part of Egypt. Egyptians live further south and west, right? So Goshen is actually very close to Canaan, not very far away at all. So Jacob's travels aren't ridiculously long, a um, couple days at most, but uh, the Egyptians are further away. Again, this is working out according to God's plan. Um, you heard for the second time that Egyptians don't want any part of shepherds. They find it abhorrent to be around them. Maybe they're smelly. I don't know why, but it's, it's somehow beneath them that they would want these people around. And so segregation of the, of the two populations made sense. It was, it, Joseph was telling his brothers, you say this and you're going to get Goshen. Pharaoh's going to make that decision, and we're going to be separate, which again works toward God's purposes. That's why all this stuff about tell them you're shepherds, tell them you keep cattle, that is pounded into them, and they listened. They listened to what used to be snotty kid brother. Okay, and the segregation also means that they can build their own culture without intermarrying, likely with Egyptians nearby or anybody else. Yes, sir. Does that imply that the Egyptians did not eat mutton? Or no, it does not. Get to that in just a moment. Okay. What they eat and what they want near them are two different things. Well, like us, right? <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> now, let me take an aside. I've mentioned this a, a couple times in passing. I spend just a few moments on it. There was a dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs that were called the Hyksos. They were Semitic. They came from one of the lines of Abraham. But they came into Egypt for a time and overthrew the Egyptian pharaohs and became pharaohs themselves. They were there for several generations, and then they were overthrown again. And, you know, bloodline Egyptians took their place. Is it possible they were serving during Joseph's time? It is. Possible. Not definite. Again, they were Semitic. They came out of the line of Shem after after the flood um and so if if the hyksos were on the throne they, they would have been more tolerant of shepherds than would have been otherwise the case so maybe if if the hyksos were in place at this time maybe that's why they were so accommodating to joseph and make sure his family was living off there in goshen and were well cared for where others might have driven them completely out of egypt that's pure speculation, pure speculation. There are, there are scholars, and it's about a 50-50 split, that think the Hyksos that came much later in history and would not have been there when Joseph was there. So I can't, can't guarantee you either of those, um, those sort of things. I'm not certain, unless we invent a time machine, we'll ever know. Because the record keeping of dates in Egypt and the way Genesis records dates just can't mathematically be lined up. Okay. Okay. Now into some fun stuff. That's God's way of saying you believe me or you don't. That's right. This is a book of faith. It's not a history book, although it has historical elements in it. We started that way way back 25 episodes ago, right? Okay. Um, chapter 47 has some challenging and interesting things. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, my father, my brothers, and their flocks and herds. And all that they own have arrived from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. He took five of his brothers and introduced them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph's brothers, what is your occupation? 
They said to Pharaoh, your servants take care of flocks, just as our ancestors did. Then they said to Pharaoh, we have come to live as temporary residents in the land. There is no pasture for your servants' flocks because the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. So now, please let your servants, excuse me, let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best region of the land. They may live in the land of Goshen. And this sentence just for Jim. If you know of any highly capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. <laughs> That's why I couldn't answer that before. I had to hold on to that sentence. <laughs> um, Joseph has a lot of power in Egypt. We've seen that through the famine and through the time of, of great plenty before that. But there are it's apparent he can't make every decision in Egypt. Some things are reserved for the king, right? And, and one of those obviously is the assignment of, uh, of the rights to own land, especially if you're a foreigner. And that decision had to be made by Pharaoh. Even though everybody's headed to Goshen or temporarily there, they don't yet, my words, have the deed to the land. So there they are. They're sort of tentatively off there on pins and needles and five brothers not identified to us come with Joseph to stand before Pharaoh. Um, to, as I say, seal the deal, if you will. And they perform very much as Joseph schooled them to. We are shepherds. They're faithful to that. And they're emphatic about that. Um, the herds are identified. And again, special uh, attention paid to that. The brothers are bold and they speak truth. And every word of it was the truth. Um, and they are what we now call sojourners. They announce themselves as temporary residents in the land. They're not looking to be there forever. Although 400 years seems a lot more than temporary to me. Okay. Okay. So even though these, the shepherds are disgusting to, to Egyptians generally, and perhaps well to this Pharaoh as well, we hear that Pharaoh has a whole bunch of herds of his own. Because yes, they do eat mutton and they do have horses to draw their, their uh, wagons and carts and they have oxen and, and many other things. Um, so he, 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 Pharaoh, is looking for talent. He's the ruler of the richest and most technologically advanced nation on earth. And he's not resting on his laurels. If you can make him richer by making his herds uh, more successful and you happen to be from Canaan, he cares not. So we get evidence that the people of, of Jacob's family are entering into a very favorable administration. As long as they provide value, they're welcome. And yeah, help me out, says Pharaoh. I can always use the help. Okay. Then Joseph brought his father, Jacob, and presented him before Pharaoh. Just let that picture in your mind, these two. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how long have you lived? Jacob said to Pharaoh, all the years of my life travels are 130. All the years of my life have been few and painful. The years of my travels are not as long as those of my ancestors. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. I have to get the sense that they talk about much more than that, these two men. But that's what's recorded for us. So now the family, after the five brothers have testified, they're legally settled in Goshen. They have their land defined and deeded to them, if you will. And Joseph brings his dad to meet the, the king, uh, king of the world, more or less, in, in human terms. And so what you have is these two men face each other is the greatest king on earth, right? Pharaoh. He stands in front of the man God has chosen to lead his people, the nation of Israel. They stand nose to nose. It's not just a, hey, how you doing? It's like Superman and Zod, if you're into comic books, right? The, these two great superpowers that, that, that have diametrically different views of life. Pharaoh, as he stands there, is, is more wealthy and militarily powerful. He's, he's, in those two terms, 
he is the most powerful person on earth and the richest, uh, monetarily speaking. Jacob is superior in his spirituality. He is superior in his relationship with the one true God. Which one is superior to the other? The text told us, right? Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Remember earlier in, in uh, much earlier in Genesis, Melchizedek, this spiritually mystical um, person appears and blesses Abraham. And we understand the priest's superiority to Abraham at that stage. And that was explicitly told to us. The superior blessed the not superior. And if we look forward to the New Testament, in the seventh chapter of Hebrews, we find this exact quote. Now, without dispute, the inferior is blessed by the superior. God tells us who the superior is. It's the one who is spiritually walking with the Lord, not the one with all the shiny buildings and chariots and the like. Now, think about that for just a moment. Before we get into the age thing, what must Pharaoh have thought about that? How many people ever treated Pharaoh as though he was the other than superior? And yet Pharaoh took it, accepted it, and they parted peacefully. Pharaoh knew, somehow, Pharaoh knew the superior nature of this man, Jacob. He knew Joseph. And he, well, he had an inkling through Joseph, and if this man is Joseph and 11 others' father, how, and Joseph has this power, how much more power might this father have? And Pharaoh knew it. He had lots of clues. Among them are this visit. And also for a good deduct too, that uh, wherever Jacob, just like Joseph, where he went, uh, everybody around him were blessed. Absolutely. This, again, with uh, Jacob, with uh, Laban, that's why, remember when uh, Jacob was gonna up and leave Laban? Laban, no, no, I could tell that God is with you. Uh -huh. uh, you were blessed me and so forth. Thank you. you. Jacob, leave it all. And we are seeing that consistently through, although he slipped here and there, we see that consistently through Jacob's life. You're exactly right. So Jacob said that uh, he is... He, He's aged, but he's not as old as his ancestors. And we remember Abraham had been called to the Lord when he was 175. Isaac, a little bit older, but 180, not as old as this. The Noah generation or those interceding, but um, he's 130 and, and he senses the end of his life. Although we remember Isaac sensed the end of his life and 30 years later, he was still around. Um, but he understands he's not going to live as long as his ancestors. He, he has that sense. God's already told him he's going to die in Egypt. And he stands in front of the ruler of Egypt as he says these words. So he's, he's internalized that. And he's at peace with that. Um, and, and why is this? I mean, he's had a tough life. I mean, just having to deal with those 12 sons is tough enough. And, and the heartbreak of losing Joseph and, and all of these other turmoils of the unfaithfulness of his sons and and the time with Laban and all the rest of it. he's had a tough life he really has and uh he, he doesn't complain he's just stating the facts before pharaoh i've had a hard life it's not as long as my ancestors but here i stand to use luther's words here i stand and what he seems to understand and recognize, and we have heard it over and over again, and we've certainly heard it through his son, Joseph, is that God has carried him through it all. And for whatever success he has in life, he gives God the credit. Okay. All their lives, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had, had not had a place they could call their own. I mean, with one small exception, the grave at Machpelah, where Abraham and Sarah and Isaac now lay. Um, apart from that, they, they've never owned land. And yet that was one of, prime, one of the prime promises of God. And yet now they've been given a deed to land in, in Egypt. That too by God's hand, but not according to his promise. The promise has not been realized. It's not all about just 
land. Okay, a couple more verses. Um, so Joseph settled his father and his brothers. He gave them territory in the land of Egypt in the best region of the land, the land of Ramesses, just as Pharaoh had commanded. Joseph also provided food for his father, his brothers, and all his father's household, according to the number of their little children. So there they are up in the northeast corner of Egypt, right? Again, most of the population is well away from them. They're down toward Memphis, which was the center of Egypt at that time, not Cairo, uh, much further south and west. Um, Joseph allocates food during this famine to his family. And again, it had to be rationed because they're in the midst of a, as, as the Bible knows it, a worldwide famine. And it was the number of their little children that was the way we decided how much each household would get wasn't the, the birth order. It wasn't the, the uh, power exhibited. It wasn't any of that. It was according to keeping people well and alive. That's the way Joseph allocated these things. Okay. Not much there, but going forward, there is. In verse 13 and following, but there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that could be found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan as payment for the grain they were buying. Then Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's palace. When the money from the lands of Egypt and Canaan was used up, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your very eyes? Because our money has run out. Then Joseph said, if your money is gone, bring your livestock and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses, the livestock of their flocks and herds, and their donkeys. He got them through that year by giving them food in exchange for all their livestock. Okay, this sets the stage for what follows, but you get the idea here. The, the famine's getting bad, we discussed several sessions ago that Joseph had a system where you had to pay for the grain. It, just living wasn't enough to get the grain. You, you paid for it, you had a stake in it, um, and you were responsible for it. And, and you had the dignity of, of purchasing and, and sustaining you and your family with food that you had purchased. So that method continued, but the, the famine had eaten up all the money in that situation but not all the grain as yet. So now, what do you do when the money's gone, right? And the answer was, we'll have a barter system. You bring your livestock and we'll, we'll reckon that as, as money and give you grain and keep you alive. Um, that kept the people alive for another year. Okay? That's the, that's, just the setup for the big hammer that falls in the next few verses. You get the idea. Once again, they have the dignity of buying, but you heard it was all the livestock that they paid in that instance. So in verse 18 and following, when that year was over, they came to him the next year and said to him, we cannot hide from our Lord that the money is used up and the livestock and the animals belong to our Lord. Nothing remains before our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your very eyes, both we and our land? By us and our land in exchange for food, and we with our land will become Pharaoh's slaves. Give us seed that we may live and not die. Then the land will not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. Each of the Egyptians sold his field for the famine was severe. So the land became Pharaoh's. Joseph made all the people slaves from one end of Egypt's border to the other end of it. But he did not purchase the land of the priests because the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh and they ate from their allotment that Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, since I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you. Cultivate the land. When the crop comes in, give one-fifth of it to Pharaoh, 
The remaining four fifths will be yours for seed, for the fields, and for you to eat, including those in your households and your little children. They replied, You have saved our lives. You are showing us favor, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Curious situation at this point. The Israelites are, or the, Israel, the, the sons of Israel are living over there in Goshen freely, and all the Egyptians have just sold themselves into slavery. 400 years later, you know, it's going to look very, very different, um, at least on the Israelites' part of, point of view. So you get the idea. Cattle's gone. The money was gone before that. And they have nothing to trade but their own labor, their, their own selves, and their land. All they had left was that. There is nothing else. And what I'm going to say is going to be provocative, somewhat intentionally so, but all of it comes from this book that's over 35 years old. It does not come from the modern news reports. Okay? It comes straight out of here, a book given to me by one of your classmates. I thank him for it. Um, so... They proposed to, they proposed, not Joseph, it was their idea to give up their land and their selves in exchange for food in order to keep their children alive. They proposed this to Joseph, right? And so people will ask, if this passage becomes controversial, people will say, well, wait a minute, it wasn't Joseph this paragon of virtue just out to enslave people for his own good? Well, the answer is no. At first, remember, it was their idea, not his. Okay, and, and he didn't bring them to this point. And whatever gain there would be financially um, doesn't accrue to Joseph. It all becomes Pharaoh's. It always has. It remains that way. So he has no personal stake in this other than he's the arbiter on, on Pharaoh's behalf. What comes of this is what later will be called a feudalistic economy. That is, you have your king and everybody supports the king economically. In exchange, the king provides protection for all of those who provide his well-being, right? That's, that's the feudal system. And this is, as far as the Bible reveals to us, and as far as we know of human history, this appears to be the beginning of that line of thought. But consider this, if Joseph and Pharaoh, by extension, had simply taken all the grain and just handed it out to everybody, what would that have led to? I mean, just freely just giving it to them. Uh, here's some thoughts. The government would soon be out of everything. And the government would collapse, and, and leading to chaos and, and no protection for the people. Right? You may have had tremendous social upheaval. And this is speculation, I grant you, but this is what happens, I mean, just look through human history, when there's not sustenance for the people and there's, there's not protection for the people, there is unrest, right? Those stores of food that uh, Joseph put away in those first seven years would very soon be gone, because if you don't have to pay for something, it has no value to you, so you take any amount of it. Yeah, People would hoard it. Yep. And it wouldn't be long when some people hoarded it and others were starving. Exactly. And then that's that would have been the very likely result of just handing out food without without any system to keep people alive as best they could. Also consider that they've gone through more than two years of at least three years of famine at this point with Joseph, maybe a bit more. And they've learned to trust him. He's been very fair. He's he's always treated them well, and he hasn't treated anybody more handsomely than another. And they, they, they respect that. So they bring this system to him, and as a result, they maintain their own self-respect. I'll say a few more words about that in just a moment, because I'll fill in some of the blanks in, in the implied story here. But first, remember, there's a state religion in Egypt, right? It's that pantheon of gods that they have. We had the, the words about the priests, and the priests did not enter into this system with Joseph. They alone got to keep their land and, and work their land and, and keep their own stuff, right? And, and 
That was because Pharaoh got the advantages of all these priests and magicians and whatever they were. In exchange, he gave them land and, and financial support. That was his contractual deal with them. My sense is that Joseph wouldn't have much liked or honored a deal like that. He had no allegiance to the priests of Egypt. He remained true to the Lord God of Israel. So this wouldn't have been his idea to accept them, to make them an exception, right? So my sense is there was probably some disagreement between Pharaoh and Joseph on this. But it went the way of, of Pharaoh's way of doing things. That was maintained, right? And then we get just the facts, the Joe Friday sort of presentation here. Um, but you get the sense that this isn't Joseph making this decision. This decision, again, was one of those things reserved for the king. Okay, back to the rest of this thing. Joseph does exactly what he and the people agreed to do in terms of the selling of labor and land for food. Let me fill in the blanks. The people, when they sold their land, continued to work it. They were still on it. Pharaoh owned it, and they were, if you will, itinerant farmers on the land that had been theirs before. Okay? They didn't hold the deed. Renter isn't the right word, but they were still working the land. Joseph gave them seed to sow into the land. And whatever came up out of that land, as they weren't the owners, but they were the farmers, whatever came up, they kept 80% of it. From that, they could plant the next year, next time's crop and feed their family. 20% was given to Pharaoh. Think of that as a tax. Does that 80 20 split sound familiar to anybody? How much federal income tax do you pay on your gross? Most people, it's right in that neighborhood. Yeah, you know, it's, it's in that neighborhood of 80 20. And oh, by the way, anybody here think they own the land that their home sits on? Stop paying your taxes. What happens? Right? He, is this the ancient roots of that system that we still live under in some ways, right? So the farmers were paying absolutely no rent for the land that they're on now. It's Pharaoh's. They're working it. Their, their share of paying is 20% is is, is of the profit, or excuse me, 20% of the crop. They don't have to invest in anything. Pharaoh takes care of that. They don't have to pay for upkeep. Pharaoh's taking care of that. They've got 80% free and clear for only their personal needs. This is Joseph's deal with them. Naturally, they stayed alive in this deal. They actually prospered a little bit. So their personal needs are their only things that they have to deal with out of that 80%, except sowing it back in for next year's crop as well. All right? So the worst that what they sold was 20% of what they grew. That's, that was the terms of enslavement. I'm not, I'm not saying slavery is a good deal, and this isn't the 1860s we're talking about here at all. And the terms are the same, but the conditions are very, very different. Okay. And again, I got, I couldn't hold myself back. You know, <laughs> I, was, I couldn't, I, could, I jumped the gun. Right. Okay. Um, some words about ancient slavery. Um, when people were in a bad way financially, the ancients, and it, it was especially true in Israel, the way to take care of somebody who was in very bad situation, owed a lot of money or had fallen on hard times, was to bring them into servitude in your household, right? And, and that was the accepted way of caring for somebody who had, had fallen, again, on hard times. These people who were now considered slaves of Pharaoh or ancient slaves of anybody for that matter um, were beholden to the master, so to speak. But the master's job was to feed and care for the people in his household, including those who were so-called slaves or servants. So Pharaoh had a responsibility to everybody in the nation to care for them. And so it was. And, and this... Joseph arranged that with the people, and Pharaoh agreed to it. And so it was, as it turns out, as disgusting as that word slavery is for us 
who know the history that led up to the 1860s, slavery in this situation, in this culture, was to the best benefit of the people to get them through the remainder of the famine. And you'll notice going forward, we had one year where they had to, you know, they ran out of money. And the next year, they, they um, ran out of animals. And the next year, this agreement was put in place. But the next two or three years, no additional agreements had to be made. This one took care of everybody for the remainder of the famine. Okay, only gonna cover two more verses tonight. The, uh, the last, uh, next to last is 26. So Joseph made it a statute, which is in effect to this day throughout the land of Egypt. One fifth belongs to Pharaoh, only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. So under the circumstances, it worked well. And then it was made into what we would consider public law today. And there is no recorded instance of complaining. It's not like the Israelites leaving on the Exodus, right? Where they complain like every other chapter or every other paragraph, excuse me. Um, no complaining. Apparently it worked well, at least as recorded in the Bible, it worked well for, for all. And when it says this system remains in effect to this day, that's, that's not to imply 2021 or 2022. That's the day of the recording of Genesis, which presumably was Moses' time, more or less, right? Now, we don't know that Moses specifically recorded this, but to his time anyway. And the last verse we'll cover tonight, verse 27. Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they owned land there. They were fruitful and increased rapidly in number. Remember God's first command to humans? Go be fruitful and multiply. Finally, <laughs> Finally, faithfully, they're doing that. They did it unfaithfully in other places. So the people of Israel in Goshen prosper and grew for a very long time. And this also leads us toward the time of Moses. But there's uh, an episode in between where the people's fate in Goshen turned into something very, very different. And then they needed to be rescued out of enslavement in the land of Egypt. Um, they grew exceedingly. They're becoming a nation. They're not a family or a collection of 12 families anymore. They're becoming the nation that God intended them to be, as God promised Jacob they would be before he left Be'er Shabbat. And those 12 sons and their households would become 12 tribes. A tribe is approaching nation size in itself when you see the numbers later in the, in the time of the Exodus. And so God's promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is coming true in just one short sentence. They are becoming great in number, not quite as great as the sand, sand uh, grains on the seashore, but great nonetheless. And they are building their culture. They are building their identity. They are building their religion and their religious practices. They're becoming truly a nation under God. But it's not all going to be peaches and cream. We know that. We can see that on the horizon. Uh, but maybe, maybe some of those trials are good things. Don't we learn through hard times and hard lessons? We learn those things that we do that are not good. We learn not to do them again. And, and, and we find a different path that is more fruitful. Any questions before I offer some last thoughts briefly this evening? I still think slavery is a little too much of a term. Yeah. Yeah, I, I prefer others. I mean, I, I deal with the translators that, that we have and the preponderance of them will use that term. Um, indentured servitude is probably a better term, but it's awfully awkward to read in front of a group <laughs> over and over again. I think with an indentured servitude, Bill, well, you're paying off a debt. Yeah. And then you get out of that debt. So mm -hmm. I don't know what a good term is, but slavery is a little harsh. What it is. For those of us who live after the 1860s, it's, yeah. it's really hard to swallow. And we hear that word and we get mental images that don't fit the time period we're talking about. And, and you're right, that word is prejudicial in itself. And, and like you, I don't know a better word yet. 
Maybe well, before God calls me home, I'll figure it out. New Testament all calls us slaves of Christ. Yeah, yeah, and in the Greek, that's doulos, and slave and servant is doulos in in uh, in that. And the word ministerial means to serve. So yes, another word, serve. Yeah, it's it's a tough concept to deal with. Um, just um, yeah. attitudinally, because we're conditioned very, very different. Again, especially in these times when we're very sensitive to to racial issues that harken back to the 1860s and 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 well before. You hear that word, and bells go off, and you have a very different mental image. Um, and so I wanted to be, I wanted to spend some time with that tonight. And um, but thank you, Tony. I wish I. Maybe yeah. between the two of us, we'll figure this out someday. Yeah. Okay. Um, we exist as God's people, don't we? I mean, there is no existence beyond that. And, and if you look at your life, if, as I look at my life, do we not look like Jacob's sons in the good, bad, and ugly, and in the faithful and fruitful at various times? I think we all do. Um, will not recount that. But, but God was preparing those 12 sons, each of them in their own ways, each of them for their own needs, um, through all of those trials and testings and misdeeds and the, the fruits of, of good labor. What's God preparing you for? It's, it's probably not the same as we have 13 in this room tonight instead of 12. I can be Jacob. You can be the other 12. <laughs> I'm, I'm soon to be gone, right? Um, what, where's God taking you? And, and you can't, at no point can you say, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much done with life. Um, God's leadership is going to have to exist with somebody else. Jacob didn't say that. He was 130. So none of us get to escape. By, by claiming age as a privilege. God is still preparing us for tomorrow and next month and whatever follows. And it's different for each of us, but it's all God's purpose. If we have a heart and a mind open enough to receive that direction. And then collectively, God is doing that for us as a group as well. So what is God doing with God's collective people to prepare us for the people that follow us, for the people that need to know God's glory and, and God's word. So it's not just you, it's y'all. You're close enough to Texas to know what the plural of that is, right? All y'all. Yeah. Okay. Um, next time we, we've, uh, take a look at the next two chapters. There are only 50 chapters, so we'll only have two sessions left. Both will be in January. You'll see that in a minute. Um, next time, we're going to see the last days of Jacob, uh, as he's predicted for himself already. Um, but before he goes, uh, chapter 49, we're going to see his individual blessings on the 12th. And um, we've pointed to some of those in advance, Simeon's in particular. Um, but we'll we'll see we'll hear those and the poignance of, of all of that as Father says good uh, farewell to the twelve. And just to remind you, calendars we will not be together for the next three weeks: Christmas, New Year's, and um, the installation of our new pastor on January 9th. We'll interrupt the next three weeks. So back on January 16th, and then again on well, excuse me, you'll be here on the 19th. 19th and 26th is when we'll be back to finish up Genesis. So the 50th chapter and a, a some thoughts on the wrap up of all of Genesis will happen on the uh, on the 26th, right? And then uh, I have a preaching assignment and then Exodus. So the first uh, the first no, it's not the first Wednesday it's the first Sunday and the Wednesday following in February we will have our Exodus class. Okay, and we'll kick off, kick off with something new and something old all at once. Okay, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, the night is late and your word is wonderful. So thank you, Lord God, for being with us this evening.
protect all my sisters and my brothers as they head for their homes and enlighten them with your word and especially enlighten them with the coming of your son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Keep us all safe, keep us all well, and keep us all in your word, witnessing to it in the, in the brothers and sisters we've yet to meet. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.